Okay, hi everyone. I think we'll get going now because I know what it's like. Most people are potentially trying to join us from school and it's almost impossible to be logged onto a webinar at four o'clock. If it's not between dismissing bubbles or trying to keep on top and catch up with staff that you've not seen through the day, it's a really difficult time in the classroom and at school at the moment. So we shall get started and no doubt people will be joining us as we go. So thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to take a look at mastery in a broad and balanced curriculum. And really importantly, we're gonna share with you how Inspire Education can support you in achieving that for your school. We're going to take a look at 21st century skills, really important given the year we've had, ensuring what happens in the classroom is in line with children's skills at home and online. We want to look at that broad and balanced curriculum, incorporating PHSE, PE, art, music, DT, our wider curriculum, focusing more specifically on history and we'll look at geography as well. We want to look at a progression in knowledge and skills, chronology, time and place, really important in our history. And then we'll look at how we can support you and your school's personalised curriculum map. Regardless of where your school and your setting is, even if we've got people joining us today that are just a mile apart, it's so important that every school has a personalised curriculum map and Inspire Education, we want to support with that. So there are our aims. Uh, some of you know me already, so that's I'm Tara. So I'm a consultant here with Inspire, deputy head and a curriculum lead. Um, quite a bit of experience now across a number of settings and my expertise are in English. And then we have Luke, lovely Luke. Uh, he's the co-founder of Inspire Education. There he is, he's appeared. Hello, Luke. Hey there, everyone. So I always Hello. say, despite that baby face, uh, <laughs> he has consulted in hundreds of schools on curriculum growth, pedagogy, working with large multi-academy trusts on content delivery. So it's great that we're both here today to share what we've been up to. Okay, so let's look at somebody else. She's, she's not here, you know, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector can't join us for our webinar today, sadly. But I am going to just link to some of her really key messaging. This is a big statement, okay? Without a curriculum, a building full of teachers, leaders and pupils is not a school. And I think at the moment we've all felt that a school's been everything we've been, we've been doing social work supporting families really ensuring we're there for our local community but somehow it's enough to make us wince at the moment the thought of Ofsted isn't it we do still have to keep our curriculum and our curriculum intent very high on our agenda we almost need to pop to one side everything that's going on in response to covid and just for the next 45 minutes, we're really going to think about the curriculum. So if we look at the next slide here, key takeaways. A good school achieves a careful balance. Time is limited. And gosh, don't we know it this year because we're dealing with the fallout of last academic year. Our time is very limited. But it's interesting that Amanda makes reference here to what resources we should draw on and the ways that we teach. And that's quite important. I can share with you anecdotally um, a school we worked with in Cheshire who were recently Ofsted and Ofsted have wanted to come back um, and follow up on their history and their, their geography in particular in their curriculum. And they were asked by the Ofsted inspectors, what resources are you using? How are you ensuring mastery? And they reference newly qualified or recently qualified teachers and said, well, well, what would you give them? What sort of pedagogy have you got behind your history and your geography curriculum? What are the resources you use to ensure that coverage? I thought that was quite interesting. We are seeing this shift that online resourcing and a blended curriculum 
used to be for a lot of schools an, an icing on the cake sort of situation. It was maybe an add-on. But more and more we see, and certainly in response to last year, it's now a necessity. It should be part of your curriculum offer. So rather than an add-on and optional, you need to have built into your curriculum quality resourcing and the use of technology, the use of technology in the classroom. And we want to show you, we're going to show you Inspire Education, but of course you think about your own school curriculum map and what you can take from us, we're here to support you, whether, you, whether it's through Inspire or any other means, how you can help develop this blended curriculum that uses technology to support a mastery curriculum. Okay. I'm going to hand you over to Luke here because he really is the expert. Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke Whitehouse, he has put a lot of years into the study of the pedagogy in the classroom. He's going to talk us through some 21st century skills. Thank you, Luke. Thanks, Tara. Well, hello, everyone. I hope you've had a good day, good, uh, good few hours with the children. Um, just a few things that, that Tara has mentioned about mastery of the curriculum. I think what, one of the things that we kind of apply a lot of our attention to is knowledge. You know, we want the children to understand these subjects, we want them to understand the topic we're giving them, whether it be about ancient Egypt, whether it be about the Great Fire of London or the Victorians. We want them to understand those. But, but as educators, there's been a massive cultural shift, hasn't there? We've seen this in the, in the Ofsted framework. Years ago, what we could do is we could impart knowledge to children. But any child can get knowledge now. I mean, YouTube, Google itself is just an, an immeasurable source of knowledge. So as practitioners, what we need to do now is use that knowledge so children can apply skills. That's, that's the whole point of what we're trying to achieve as teachers. I mean, we have no idea, absolutely no idea what the world is going to be like in 20 years time. If we think about how culture has changed in just five years, you know, I think this statistic's right. I think something like 75% of the jobs that children will have in 10 to 15 years time have not been invented yet. And yet we're trying to educate those children towards that. It's almost an impossibility. So this is why we, we try and use, and I think we do it really successfully, use 21st century skills inside our resource. It's taking the curriculum to the next level, but it's not just about knowledge and it's not just about core skill acquisition, but it's also about training those children to be good citizens, right? We want those kids. We don't want them to be all university professors, do we? You know, that's not the job of what civilization is. What we want them to do is we want them to go into the big wide world eventually and contribute to society, know things about love, joy, be able to talk to one another, be able to be friends with one another, to be able to collaborate with one another. That's what we're trying to do also as practitioners. So I, I've got a little question and you can, I can't see what's being put in the chat. So I think Tara might have to shout out there's some of the responses. No problem. In terms of the 21st century skills, if that's something you've heard of before, it could be completely new to you. It's a massive uh, agenda now. What different skills do you think encompass in the 21st century skills? What skills do we need children to have in order to be really good contributors to civilization? So that's an open-ended question right there. Stop me speaking. If you put them in the chat and then we'll have a little feedback. So I'll give you what? 30 seconds to chat to the screen, <laughs> chat to the person next to you. What are they? 21st century skills. This is when we really miss being in a conference room, isn't it, Luke? <laughs> to be honest, you just miss being in the classroom, really, because uh, with children, you get responses. <laughs> OK, we've got a great answer there. The first one, we've got someone saying communication. I think communication is going to be key. Communication is a really good one. So there's, is there any of this? That's what we've got at the moment. We've got communication. Oh, we've got someone here working with other people. So I think that if we turn that into a C word, I think they've pretty much got that, working yeah. with others. We'll, Collaboration. We'll yeah, great we'll answer. Go, we'll go through the, um, 
what we call the four C's. So the four C's are critical thinking, communicating, collaborating, and creating. So these are the kind of four 21st century skills that encompass learning in the classroom. So problem solving would be, would be a critical thinking one. So there's lots of different synonyms we can use, but we call them the four C's. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm, in a second, I'm going to show you a few of our resources and show how these 21st century skills are just layered in to everything. And we don't have a lesson on critical thinking. We don't have a lesson on communication, but what we do do is underline in every single lesson, embed these 21st century skills. So, so the children don't even know they're doing it. And actually as teachers, we don't even know we're doing it either. It's just there for you to, 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 to reassure you that these are being brought to the, the attention of the children. So we're trying to build those children up to the 21st century in an ever-changing world. So the, the, we're moving well, we're well into the digital world now, aren't we? So I'll first show you some stuff on critical thinking. So if I just share my screen. Okay, so we're looking at a, a World War II, World War I scene right now. It's in our World War theme. So critical thinking, well, as you probably know, right, it's all about finding solutions to problems. And as practitioners, as professionals, whatever role we're in, whether we're a teacher, whether we're an accountant, whether we're a university professor, right? We always have to use critical thinking. It's part of the mundanity of life. We have to do it. These are um, effectively getting children to know how to weed out problems. And it's gonna help students to figure out things on their own, okay? so. This is what we're going to do here now on this theme so there's a host of lessons that will go with this uh, we're not looking at those lessons right now we're looking at critical thinking so on here i'm going to play a little video hopefully you'll hear it it's on this button here we're going to start off with our chief commander i'm going to just play just 20 seconds 15 seconds of it all right soldier listen up we have a critical situation one of our comrades has been captured by the enemy in a nearby town. It's absolutely vital that we get him back. Okay, notice he used the phrase, a critical situation, because we're using critical thinking. I'm going to go this through this really, really quickly. You can imagine, as we're all teachers here, how great this would be to introduce a particular lesson or a theme to the children. Their job is to find their lost comrade, and they've got to choose a selection of items and characters to take on a mission. So if I go on the first one here, choose characters, here's a selection of characters I've got. I've got a nurse, a female soldier, a female spy, a male soldier, a male spy, and a navigator. And if I click on one, I've got my statistics. So we can see this particular chap, he's really speedy, he's really stealthy, he's not great on leadership. Now, the question is, as we think about critical thinking, do we need a leader on our mission? Do we need somebody who's potentially um, really good at, let me just go back again, female soldier. Do we need someone who's really intelligent and brave? Now, these are the things that we're trying to bring into the children. And what, the, what we can do as a class, individuals or in pairs, groups, we choose these characters. And you can see on the right-hand side, we're building up our mission portfolio our statistics depending on who we choose shows the overall team so we can see we're really intelligent at the moment and we're not very speedy so depending on who you choose now the children can then choose what items they'd like to take okay and that the, the chief commander tells us specifically what type of mission they're going to go on so they've got to choose really carefully and again if i just click on a selection of items here you can see that my statistics change again okay so i'll just click a, another few and all of this is real history you know these are real items the characters here were real roles in world war ii so i'm going to go on to the route now and there's three routes we can take and i was going to give you a little one here to have a little bit of a communication with me so if i go my route to, to find our lost comrade i've got four different options i can either go in the river the tunnel the woods or the enemy path so first person right first served 
Which route shall I take? Bass's finger first. No, oh, someone was quick there. Oh, Nicole said tunnel. She wants to go in the tunnel. Let's go for it. We're going to go in the tunnel. Okay, we're going to go in the tunnel. Now, let me just remind us, depending what items we've chosen, depending what characters we've chosen, is this the route we want to take? Now, obviously, we've gone through this really quickly. So if I go through the tunnel and I choose that, uh, we've got a problem. We didn't take our gas mask. And going through the tunnel is essential. And the thing is, as well, they're going to be reading as they go through. We're going to be chatting to partners. We're going to have a whole group discussion. I can print these out and put them across the room so we can create a real scenario for the children. Really cool activity. And we're going to be we're, we're using critical thinking. So I won't show any more of this. Of course, we go into the town and eventually we've got a route to take our lost comrade. Do we find him? We'll never know. You're going to have to do it yourself. But what, you, what you're showing is there, Luke, absolutely our children, they're making choices, they're thinking like historians. You can imagine, teachers all here, the arguments in the classroom, no, we shouldn't have taken the tunnel, let's take this route. And you would want them to back that up with quick, critical thinking, therefore demonstrating their knowledge and skills this, for this period in history. There's almost a game-like content, it's a bit like gaming, isn't it, Luke? And, and the the interface for the children, they're used to this. They're used to this problem solving, but here we have them using it in their curriculum. It's just great. It is great. And you know, we've I've ta taught this lesson a few times and we've applied this to different contexts. So one class we're doing Anne Frank as their significant figure. And so what we did, we created this scenario to save Anne Frank. And Anne Frank was trapped, of course, writing her diary. And so we created a team to go and save her. And it was amazing. The writing in it was incredible for, for literacy. And uh, look, you can see your school here. We've done pretty poorly. OK, right. So that, 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 that's just one example. I'll go to the next one a little bit quicker because Tara's always on at me about timings. And I'm really sorry. <laughs> so the next, one, the next one is this is our Victorian theme. Uh, one of the scenes is, is the town. The other one's Industrial Revolution. On a selection of our science lessons, they learn a little bit about Sherlock Holmes. And so on this particular activity, the children will break down a crime. OK, so I'll just quickly again, just play a little video. Sherlock Holmes, private investigator, violin player, amateur chemist. OK, so there's Sherlock Holmes is sending you on a little mission, a little detective story. It's based upon one of Cohen Arthur Doyle's real stories, real texts, and they're going to try and crack the case. And there's different, you can see these little puzzle icons. Again, we're on critical thinking here, and there's different clues to find out who the mystery man is. And we apply that to our STEM lessons. So that introduces them to some science stuff. And then in STEM, they've got a selection of different types of science lessons they can do. And again, we'll show you later, but these are all lesson plans. We've got the lesson plans for you. So we can go on some fingerprints here and we do a little fingerprint exercise. So they're using critical thinking to build into them some lessons. Um, last one I'll show you at this point is, this is the chocolate factory. Um, again, this is gonna be used to critical thinking, but also we're gonna bring it to some creativity. So that's the next step. Um, and before we go into creativity, Tara, have I missed anything else? Anything you'd like to add to this point? No, I'm just laughing at my notes because I, at this point we should be done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, right, okay. So it, this, yeah, no, you, you do this one. Let, let's stick here with the Maya and the Chocolate Factory because I, I love this theme and I think the kids will love this scene too. So let's have a look through this and then just to keep the teachers engaged, I promise you I'm going to show you some work in books and see what happens and what we get out of our children. So we'll move on to creativity and um, creativity of course is all about thinking outside the box, innovation, right? So most of those children at some point are going to be innovating in their careers, innovating in their personal lives. So on this scene, they've learned all about chocolate. It's in our Maya theme. They know the process of chocolate. And essentially on this one, they're going to create their own chocolate bar and send it to market. And there's a scene here that they can choose their own, uh, their own molds. They can then go and choose their own um, 
ingredients. So if I just pick one, go quickly to the next one, choose our ingredients, our box of fruits and nuts. Yeah, so we can see how it suits our palate. I just want to read a bit more about it. So this is all about creativity. Choose the chocolate. I'll buy that. I've got no money. I've lost all my money. There we go. Creativity for you. And then final one on, on step four, you package it. You choose what type of packaging you want. And the idea is this, they'll have a lesson where they produce a marketing campaign. They do a poster, a banner in their art lessons and their ICT lessons. And then for their English lessons, they'll write a, a persuasive report and film a TV campaign. Um, I'll go through, I won't go through any of these, but I'll just show you some of our creativity stuff. Okay. Another one here, lovely for critical thinking, bre breaking Maya codes. So they learn all about the number system and they do some Maya math. So it's lovely critical thinking right there. We'll move on to collaboration. So collaboration here is a nice one. They do a, a Howard Carter documentary. Again, we've got all the lessons all sorted out for you. So it's just getting the children to do a documentary on Howard Carter once they've learned about him. Um, this one is about Tutankhamun, a nice little collaboration one, getting the children to talk and work with one another. Uh, on this particular activity, they're going to try and find out how Tutankhamun died. And the poor guy, he had a lot of problems. These are all the issues he had throughout his life. And the children have to try and figure out by working together, which is the best diagnosis for his death. That's so key there, Luke. Thank you so much for that. It's about that collaboration, the working together and what we would expect to see in any classroom, some teacher led activities, but then also the children taking their learning off, off out of the classroom. They can take their curriculum home. We've got an opportunity to do some more research to then bring it back into the classroom. So if you're OK, Luke, if we go back to the slides yeah. and well, we've already been, haven't we, there? We've been to um, ancient, we had a look at ancient Egypt. We've been to World War II, the Victorian era, and to a mine chocolate factory. So it's all there. I want to show you an example of a school that we work with because we, this opening bullet here, your curriculum really needs to be designed to give all learners the knowledge and the cultural capital they need to succeed. That's why we're designing, that's why we're teaching, our curriculum is to help our children succeed and we can do, look at list after list of how a curriculum should look but I know it's good to see it in practice and take a look at how it is in books. I'm going to take you to year six now. This is a local school and we're going to have a look at what they've been doing using the platform. So there we go. It's the industrial revolution and it's autumn term so we're, this is very fresh we look at the dates and it's been a local study so we've got our pupils thinking about the impact on their local area what we must do is plan for our children to know and remember remember this information and we do this through carefully selected themes and sequence themes thinking about what the children have learned before and what they'll of course be learning next so if we look here, and the dates are important, I want you to just note the dates on this next, uh, next slide. This is um, a history book, and we've got some really great learning objectives here. We've got the pupils studying what the Industrial Revolution was. So they're just starting their background information and also the positive impact of the Industrial Revolution. So they're starting to think about this period in time. So we've got these pupils, I happen to know they've been using the screen with their class teacher and they've also been doing a little bit of access on the iPads. They're starting to glean some information. They are beginning to think about what is this period in time? Okay, how are we going to prove or show then that the children are able to apply this knowledge, that they are going to become masters of this period in history, the Industrial Revolution. Well, I want to flick to an English book now. So this same pupil on the 21st of September. So before they'd had chance to glance at the Inspire platform. So this pupil's not yet seen 
anything about the Industrial Revolution. But it just so happens, and of course it's not a coincidence, it's been very carefully planned by the class teacher. They are also studying Oscar Wilde's The Selfish Giant, set at the same period in history. And the child has made some predictions here. Predictions on previous existing knowledge. So they have mentioned the Victoria era. They thought about maybe autumn because there were some leaves falling. So they've got some prior knowledge. And they think, if I recall, they mentioned that the children are waiting around and fed up. So they don't seem to know too much. Fast forward. They now have had two weeks in history looking at the Industrial Revolution. What do we expect to see? What do we anticipate? Here, we've got the child referencing that children had to go to work. We've got it to, some technical vocabulary here. I can see the word, the crucial times, unsanitary streets, dangerous, mills, factories, pollution, Industrial Revolution. Suddenly, this child has new knowledge, and that knowledge, and I'd love to share this with you in a few weeks' time, is going to start to creep into their narrative, into their story writing in English. Because I know that this child has planned, well, the teacher has planned for them, to write a narrative as one of the children at this time in history. So if we've carefully sequenced and have mastery of the curriculum, how might this look in the child's English book? Imagine your joy as a teacher at reading a sentence such as, um, I don't know, gazing back at the smoke billowing from the factory furnace. How we longed to play in the giant's secret garden. Our days were long. There was little time for play. That year six pupil has then applied knowledge about factories. They've used the techno, techno, technical vocabulary furnace, factory. And that short sentence, our days were long, there was little time for play, shows a historical understanding, which they've got from the Inspire Education scene, that childhood was very different during this period in history. And if we think back to Amanda Spielman, our chief inspector, wouldn't she be thrilled with that? She'd be very happy because she could see that the school curriculum, we've got this sticky learning and the intent of the curriculum has been realised. That pupil has exemplified mastery of a period in history. They're able to apply their knowledge of the Industrial Revolution. And in many ways, I think, they're almost tricked into some of that learning through the Inspire platform because it's so engaging, it's really fun and often feels like gaming. If you think back to that World War II scene and you were picking the different scenarios, the children would have been so immersed in that. But that's how we're going to embed the knowledge and the key skills to think like a historian. They were very excited about what we've created with Inspire. And I think you've seen there a snippet. So that's just some September work in the books in one of the schools I've been in. But let's show you a bit more. Let's perhaps have a look at ancient Egypt in some more detail, if that's okay, Luke. All good. No problem. Okay. Thanks, Tara. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of lessons, a few lessons, and some of our broad and balanced stuff that we have. I want to make something really, really clear, actually, um, is that Inspire is not a curriculum. Um, and you'll see that in a second. What it is, it's a linchpin of a really good curriculum. Your school and you maybe yourself have spent the last year and a half developing a curriculum that's bespoke to your location. And locations are one of the key parts of geography and history. So we don't want to be all things to all men. What we want to do is do something really, really good. And so we give you about 25 lessons in each theme that are masterful lessons, all enshrined with this great learning resource with all the video content, the multimedia access and so forth and so on. So just a little bit of pedagogy, just to get our heads into gear. Um, 
we think about knowledge, right? Knowledge is redundant without skill. The skill is how they're going to apply that knowledge. In your outcomes, when you get the children to produce that work, the outcome is the skill, okay? It, it's, it's driven by the knowledge. So we don't want children just to learn about geography. We want those kids to become geographers and learn and acquire the geography skills. So they're not just geographers, they're seismologists, they're geologists, they're environmentalists, they're cartographers. They're using all these skills that come a part of the geography subject. So it's knowledge that's feeding this. So I've got, you, you, you know, if you were quick enough, you might know this, but how many skills do you think appear in history? All the, and I'm talking all the way through the year groups. So if we could categorize all the skills, how many categories do you think we, we would have? And again, just type it in the chat bar. Um, there's no judgment here. So <laughs> we're hoping you're going to get it wrong, to be honest. <laughs> Oh, it's quite, the, fir the first guess is pretty good. It's close. We've got a, we all oh, we've got two quite different guesses. We've got an eight. We've got a sixteen. So we've got eight and sixteen. So we're we're doing we're doing maths here, and we're doing our eight times table. So eight eight. We've got eight and sixteen. Actually, now if we could just go to the next slide, we haven't fit them all in because we can't fit them. There's actually seven history skills. Now last couple of years particularly two years ago, where everybody was going mental on knowledge organisers and skill progressions. I saw a load of schools and you've got about 30 different skill progressions all in them. There's not, there's just seven skills show, showing a series of progressions as they get harder and harder and harder as they get older. So vocabulary would be one, chronology the other, similarities and differences, putting things in order, putting time events, key events in order. Comparing and contrast, a classic one would be the ancient Maya and the ancient Egyptians. Both civilizations had pyramids, both civilizations used hieroglyphics. Let's compare and contrast them. So they're really sophisticated skills, but there's only seven of them that they're spiraling and spiraling and spiraling as they progress through their school career. So that those are the skills, and I hope you're reassured here when you see this, that all of these skills are referenced in every single lesson. What we do is we put all of our themes in chronological, all our history themes in chronological order. So early year, earlier on in the year, so key stage one, they'll be doing those early civilizations like Stone Age. Move to year three and four, they'll be doing ancient Egypt and the ancient Greeks. And then as they come to year five and six, they'll be then learning about the Maya and they'll be learning about World War II and the Victorians. So we, we put all of our history topics in chronological order to cement this idea of subject knowledge. So if we go to the next slide. Now, we call this the Inspires Learning Triad, but it's not really our learning triad. This is what every school will be doing. And you'll see there that everything is built in concepts. So the curriculum is a concept. It's abstract. The ancient Egyptians is an abstract concept. Those children have potentially never been to Egypt, let alone ancient Egypt, right? We don't have time machines yet. We're in the digital world, but no time machines. So we've got to try and embrace this concept by working across this triad of knowledge, skill, progression. And the more they work across this triangle, the greater the concept will be. And I'll just give you a little example. One small example in a school in inner city Birmingham, a Muslim school, they were doing the Middle Ages, they were doing castles. We were talking about religion. I mentioned a church. They didn't know what a church was. They were Muslim. They didn't know what a church was. And yet we're trying to teach them about medieval religion. So these are abstract concepts that they need to gain uh, more insight in. And it's within subjects that conceptual learning underpins knowledge and skill acquisition. The vision needs to focus on how students acquire these skills of knowledge. Uh, and one of the 25 indicators Ofsted suggests as examples of important concepts of curriculum design are knowledge progression and the sequencing of concepts. So with that in mind, I'm going to show you my screen. Here we go. 
I think what we, you can all probably pick up and understand, and, I, and that you used the word reassure there, Luke, and you were right to use it, is that you see Luke's passion coming through here. This is research-based. The pedagogy behind what we're putting in front of you, we've not picked and choose resources. They have been very carefully planned to support your curriculum. And as I say, Luke, you, I always cut you off for talking too long, but it's the passion that comes through and the evidence of the work that's gone into creating content for your school curriculum. It's thanks, Trice. Amazing what three coffees can do before a webinar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right okay so this is our knowledge organizer as Tara's mentioned we're going to look at ancient Egypt so think about it. we're going to look at our knowledge web so so one of the key words in the Ofsted framework was children need to be learning webs children need to be able to connect these subjects together that's going to build this concept what I traditionally used to teach was a linear approach so I'd have 10 sequence of lessons no matter what happened in the classroom we'd get to that 10th lesson right but children don't learn like that. They need to be engaged. And by having something like this, they can take a little bit of ownership of where they want to go next. And it all leads through a pathway. But that's for another webinar, another day. So you see here uh, our ancient Egyptian web. Um, just quick, quick, quick question. How many history lessons do you notice? How many history lessons are there? <laughs> You're using the time to count now. They've been quite competitive up until now on fingers first. Oh, we had eight history. I yeah. don't even know. I don't even know. So may, let's say there's eight. Did you count? I hope you counted because I yeah. haven't. But so, no, it's absolutely what you're trying to put across to everyone and anyone looking at this as a resource is the coverage. So that yeah. broad and balance, which we hear over and over again in DFE updates, Ofsted criteria, your SLT will no doubt keep on talking about your board and balance. There it is in a web. We're gonna have sticky learning, planned and sequenced together, all the subjects there and the coverage is great. Exactly, and the thing is with ancient Egypt, the natural instinct is to teach majority of history because it's ancient Egypt. But actually when we look at it from a careful, when we look at it from another perspective and carefully think about it, there is so much more we can get into the, hist into the ancient Egyptian theme. You know, we've got lots of geography in there. We've got a little bit of art splattered here and there just to enrich the learning because children can learn through art. They can acquire the knowledge through art. They're just using a different skill. They can acquire the learning through DT. They're just using a different skill. Knowledge is everywhere. It's what's driving those different skills. So just because the history isn't giving that broad and balanced curriculum. Because knowledge isn't key, it's that skill acquisition that's driven through knowledge. So I'm going to go on to one of these lessons. Um, Tara, go on. Which lesson? Anyone want to look at a particular lesson? Oh, you can ask me or we can ask one of the... Somebody well, that's delegate. Well, that's delegate. <laughs> yeah, ask somebody who's here. Oh, somebody's picked Afterlife. Exciting. Yep, yeah, let's have a look at Afterlife. Let's look at my fifth cup of coffee. So Afterlife, okay. So we'll go on this. So here's our afterlife lessons, a history lesson. They're using chronology here. So they're investigating historical periods, presenting inclusions through thoughtful selection and organized historical information. They're going to organize something. It's a sequence of events. And you'll see here, we've got our history skill. We've got our learning objective, the classic learning objective. Every objective begins with a, an imperative verb. We want children to organize. And the objective and the skill fits into the conclusion. It's really solid stuff. This is why we want to be, well, we are that linchpin. We produce solid, stable, masterful lessons so children can really engage in their learning. We're giving you 80%. That's what we want to give you. We want to give you 80%. The other 20% is for you to adapt it to your children because we don't know your children. So you can do that with that 20%. So here's our lesson. Now you'll notice if I click on another one here, on the right hand side here are some kind of sheets and we always do some reading activities but here you'll see that it connects itself to some stuff on the scene so i'm going to show you now if i see here oops i'll show you this one can you see that that connects to some of the icons you saw in the lessons so what this is here this is 
decompartmentalizing that concept. We're breaking it down into compartments. So our science and DT lessons, the stimulus will, will appear in STEM. Um, our, some of our history significant people will appear over in our significant people. Our philosophy, which is a communication activity, appears here. Health and well-being here. So we're breaking down these concepts into compartments so the children can access knowledge and skills much more easy. So if I go on one of my STEM, I've got my STEM lessons right there. Okay. Uh, if I go on to um, my history essential skills, if I click on that, you'll notice at the bottom here are a selection of the skills and these relate to the lesson. So the lesson will tell you which icon or which button to click to provide the children the stimulus. And what's really important, and I will finish right now, so uh, don't cut me off, but what we're trying to get the children to know is what skill they're learning. You know, we're not just learning about Tutankhamun. How many times have you had somebody come in your classroom, what are you are learning about? Tutankhamun, right? It means nothing. What we want the children to say is, we're learning how to sequence events. We're learning historical vocabulary. So if I go on to the last one here and show you um, this one here, oops, it's this one. You can see this one's geography essential skills. So this is now looking at geography skills. And I've got a selection of the skills below, Britain, the wider world, the physical geography, environmental geography. And just having that on the screen, the stimulus for the lesson, that will just embed those principles a little bit deeper in the children's minds so they can tell you what skills they're trying to learn. Knowledge is feeding into skill, skill is feeding into progression, and the sequencing of those lessons and concepts will drive the vision of the subject much clearer. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. So let's wrap that up. Let's look at the history aims in a nutshell because you've no doubt been overwhelmed with the content and it's really difficult because you all have different needs as you come on the webinar and we hope we can show you a little bit of everything but ultimately we want to share with you a really clear message that it's, that it's there, that it's planned, it's organised and it's sequenced. Because in a nutshell, this is what we need to do with history. It feels big, feels huge, but if we just consider for a moment our curriculum, we've been doing these webinars for a while now, and we, we know that we've got real confidence from teachers about their maths and their English, particularly mastery in maths, well sequenced mastery in English planning. But we're going to come to you for a bit of honesty now and have a think how confident on a scale of one to ten, ten being super confident and one not really do you feel that you are within your school setting providing opportunity for mastery in history i'm just going to focus on history rather than the whole wider curriculum i'm going to pop a poll up and i just want you to think honestly no one's judging each other you can't see each other's answers but where do you think you sit within your school Okay, thanks for your feedback on that. So it's it's interesting. Yep, that's what I want. That's similarly to the last time we did that, that's averaging about five, which is kind of 50% confidence, which is understandable because we've spent so long, I think, in other curriculum areas. We're now recognizing, and most schools are on exactly the same path, that this now needs to be a priority. This needs to be an area with our curriculum that we prioritise now and ensure that the, the sequence plan for our history, our geography, science, wider curriculum subjects has that same place in the curriculum and that same drive. And we of course would like to support you with that because this is what we know. This is what we know about mastery curriculum. Okay. We've got to be broad, clear, intent, 
we hear that over and over. We've got to find a way for children to know and remember more, for content to be delivered systematically. And it's about this long-term memory we talked about. You will often sit down with a child in a history lesson and they might say, um, yes, it's, oh, I think, yeah, we, we did that in year three. Um, and they're searching, they've not been able to pin their understanding. We've got the national curriculum guiding what we do, but we need to ensure that it's developing and it's developing for our school in the right way. We hope we've offered some support, rather than overwhelming you, some support on how to get that into your curriculum and how to be guided. We should take a moment of reflection because the word mastery, there are lots of other ways to say it and lots of other ways to think about it. As you plan your curriculum and think about the subjects that you're teaching, consider are you allowing your children to become independent or autonomous? Because our ultimate aim, we want our children to confidently and competently and independently, it's that without support, to use and apply their learned knowledge and skills in a range of situations appropriate to their age. So let's cast our mind back to the year six book on the Industrial Revolution. They then apply that knowledge independently when they write their story and role, selfish giant as a Victorian child, that would be brilliant. And that's the goal we're all striving to get towards. It's blended learning. It's taking our classroom, our chalk and talk, our bread and butter teaching and supporting it through resourcing, well-resourced online services. It's interesting this date when we think back to time. This quotation here, it's taken from the DFE update. And this was in response to COVID-19 and school closures. Schools are expected to consider how to continue to improve the quality of their existing offer and have a strong contingency plan in place for remote education provision by the end of September. Well, we are today, the 1st of October. In my house, that means the heating can go on. But we are at a point where schools should have put in place provision to ensure that their curriculum, so this is an add-on or just, you know, popping some bits online for any children who may have to self-isolate, or if you have a bubble shut down, you should match your curriculum to the online provision. So what's happening in your classroom needs to be accessed online and we need our children to be able to have that opportunity to succeed. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, we're flicking between the two, either one. That last web was just a nod to something Nuke said earlier. We don't intend to be a full curriculum. It's well research-backed, research-led resources that can support what's going on in your school. We want to thank you so much for joining us on this Thursday afternoon and we are very happy to answer any questions or to help or to take you through the Inspire site.